the Broncos are one and five and headed in the opposite direction. Um, so not a good start for Denver. And it only got worse last night against Kansas City, who now extend their streak over the Denver Broncos to 16 straight games. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Russell Wilson, some potential trade candidates before the deadline, and, of course, the boo-boo breakdown with Vic Trohat later in the show. But uh, coming to help me do all that is Brad Spielberger. How's it going, Brad? Yeah, it's going great. Yeah, you know, uh, Russell Wilson never had sub-100 passing yards in the Nathaniel Hackett era, so <laughs> I'm not sure what exactly Sean Payton thinks he's fixed over there. Uh, can we talk about your your tweet late last night? You, you just, you know, randomly <laughs> brought up a tweet from uh, earlier in the offseason. Uh, are you conspiracy theorizing, or you think you're onto something there? Well, as, as luck would have it, I believe Tyler has the audio queued up of what Sean Payton said on the Colin Cowherd show back when he was a, you know, a media guy rather than a head coach so hit it Tyler what do we got it's healthy when we in scouting like to say well who does he remind you of and and, and we're not putting that pressure on Caleb saying oh you're going to be the next Mahomes but it's it's very good when you can say he's like this and so I brought it up yesterday on the show I, I I think he's a generational player now I've seen three or four games obviously not as much as I would if I was truly doing the evaluation, but it's a truly generational player, Caleb Williams. Now he, there's like a three minute clip there that I tweeted and he goes on to say that not only is he a generational player, but he is in fact so good that he is going to cause NFL teams to tank for him to the point that the NFL is going to have to introduce a lottery system to stop that happening again, right? And this is a guy who, remember, has got like quite a long history of antagonism with the NFL directly. I'm not saying Sean Payton is deliberately blowing up everything and tanking for Caleb Williams. I am, however, saying there's just a few data points pointing in that direction now. Yeah, not that uh, it would have impacted the final score, but the timeout at the end of the first half to, to basically allow the Chiefs to kick a field goal, like he himself called it a dumb decision after the game. Decision, uh, yeah, it would yeah. not have swung the outcome, but, you know, just all these little little things here and there. He's probably regretting the massive comeback against the Chicago Bears because uh, the Broncos would then be 0-6 and, and have a, a bunch of head-to-heads against other contenders for that first overall pick. And, oh, go ahead. And remember, that comeback was like a defensive player scoop and score, you know, changes the outcome kind of thing it's like even that it's like we kind of had that loss in the bag and then some stupid edge rusher goes and wins the game for us god damn it yeah it would have been down and sean payton would have been spamming like samaj p ryan (laughs) two-yard carries at the end of the game uh kind of like the the late you know they're down two scores they throw like a screen pass to him it probably was just a check down outlet and then he fumbles and loses that game as well so yeah, look, that he brought it up himself. So we're near we're, we're merely just following his own words. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, Caleb Williams is that good. The Broncos are that bad. They obviously want to change things around. I'm sure Sean Payton would love to get to work with a quote unquote generational prospect like he is. And they are squarely in that conversation because I think even some of the few talented players they do have on the roster may no longer be there in the next couple of weeks. I mean, the, the biggest drama of the of the night may have been Jerry Judy dancing in the background of Steve yeah, Smith Sr.'s hit before the wild. game even started. That was wild. I don't know how much people are aware of that, but if you go searching Steve Smith on Twitter, you'll sort of find all of the various parts of it. But he, on his own podcast, what's it called? Cut to it, I think. Um, yeah. He had basically criticized Jerry Judy and said he's sort of not doing a whole lot of anything, really. Uh, Apparently that made Jerry Judy upset. So Steve Smith had, because Jerry Judy played well recently, Steve Smith tried to talk to him before the game, so it'll be like, hey, I want to apologize for saying this and, you know, go go ball out tonight. But Jerry Judy was having none of it and, in fact, was trying to, you know, start arguments with that with Steve Smith, which, by the way, is one of the dumbest moves anybody's ever thought about it as a player like let's go start a fight with steve smith um and then this just escalated over the course of the pregame judy like dancing around behind the shot almost antagonizing steve smith to attack him and lose his mind steve smith uh maintained the high road and didn't just blowtorched him on national tv and you know ripped him for being a completely average nothing of a player tier three i think was what he called him 
I don't know about it. I don't know about it. I took the high road. I mean, I do think. Oh, that was, was taking like, the high road. Calls relative. me and asks. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, he was like, "Look, I'm not gonna kill him. <laughs> I I value sure, my sure, job. Sure. I'm not gonna lose my job." It's all job. relative on the Steve Smith scale. Of, yes. You know what? What he could have done out there, just taking a charge at him. But yeah, I mean, you know, him saying if a team calls me and asks, "Should I trade for this player?" I tell them no. <laughs> Might just be his football opinion, not just tied to the you know the personal element here. But yeah, Judy was actually very good at the end of last year. But the top 15 graded wide receiver for us from I want to say like week five or so on when their offense went from horrible to just bad uh you know he he was the main guy in that offense but yeah I mean maybe they trade him maybe they also trade Cortland Sutton who had one of the cooler touchdown catches of the season thus far last night obviously you know relatively meaningless but an awesome snag nonetheless you know release Frank Clark today and I think in a lot of ways, ignoring all the other stuff, I and mean, it does make sense. Jonathan Cooper had six pressures last night, forced the interception of Mahomes, forced a, a, an intentional grounding on Mahomes, and had a sack. And then Baron Browning, who was awesome last year, I think should return next week. So there's no reason for this team not to play a bunch of young players, let them all get experience, get reps, and yeah, lo lose some more games and get in that Caleb Williams sweepstakes. So, you know, conspiracy theories aside, do you think there's anything to that? Because when you look at... One of the ironies of the game last night is that Denver's defense actually showed up for the first time maybe this entire season, right? Like this is a, a defense that are getting blown out at a historical rate, putting some of the worst numbers we've ever seen out there going up against the Kansas City Chiefs. And, you know, it had – and even – dialing down or drilling down deeper into that, some of the underlying numbers looked even worse from a matchup perspective. Now, the Chiefs end up covering, but it wasn't the blowout that everybody thought it would or, or should have been. Um, and then in, in the one game where that actually happens, the Denver offense just completely self-destructs again, right? Looked more like last year than this year's version, which had been taking steps in the right direction. But when you look at, like, the plays that they're calling – it's like this doesn't look like – I mean, Sean Payton, whatever you think about him, was a very smart head coach and offensive mind who called smart plays and generally put players in a good position to succeed. He's not a guy who, like, calls timeout on fourth and three and dials up a play that never looked like it had any shot of working at any point and, like, leads to a sack, right? Like, what, what are we doing here? You look at what they're calling late in the game when they're trying to – theoretically mount some kind of comeback and like this does not look like an offense that's really trying to win you know it, it truly did not and like you said the defense did show up i think part of that also was the kansas city chiefs offense they continue to be uh, atrocious on yeah. the third and short uh, i actually you know tweeted last night i thought maybe eric the enemy losing him was a big element of that they were 31st in epa per play on third and one last year as well um and, and they just always get too cute everyone uh, you know in chicago loves to i, I get a million matt naggy uh, responses <laughs> in my comments like look andy reed's running the offense and that's his you know, it's where he learned all of his football from to a degree. So, uh, yeah, but it's just like, why are you doing a fake field goal when you could just drop back with Patrick Mahomes? Why are you kicking some early field goals? I know it was windy and there were other elements at play, but the Chiefs could have scored 30 points fairly easily if a couple other things swing their way. But, yeah, the offensive play calling, which has been largely pretty good, you know, for the Broncos so far this season, top half of the NFL and a bunch of, you know, underlying metrics. Granted, they played some horrible defenses. But, but yeah, it was just not a winning recipe by any stretch. And then Russ, man, I mean, we'll get into him in a little bit here, but it just looks broken. I mean, even plays where we could blame, you know, some of the offensive linemen, the, the, the Chris Jones sack on, on Mike McGlinchey, I mean, Russ could have taken four steps up in the pocket on that play. He was only about eight yards back, so it's not like he was hanging 12 yards deep, but just little elements of that. Yeah, taking a sack on fourth down, it, it's just everyone, the whole thing is broken. Yeah, and, and the, the, the thing is, it had looked a little bit better up until basically last night, and then it went all the way back to just complete disaster again. Um, and maybe Russell Wilson does look a little bit more athletic than he did last year, but it's still – it's still bad decisions, right? It's still not enough to be like he's he's not going to he's never was and is never going to be Lamar Jackson or Justin Fields. So you can't survive just with the athleticism. You still need to be a functional, high level quarterback as well, and that isn't there right now. Um, yeah, we'll get onto the the Chiefs' offense in a second, but you know Travis Kelsey was fantastic in that game, even with his bum ankle. Obviously, they were feeding him early in the game. You get the the lateral, which I'm fascinated by those plays because. Everybody within Kansas City maintains that they are basically Travis Kelsey going rogue mid-play. But they, are, they look designed in terms of 
the plays are drawing up trail runners. Like, there's a guy there by design at almost all times in these plays, right? And maybe Travis Kelsey certainly has the, like, he's deciding to pitch it to him, but it's, he's there. Like, it's not like there are offenses in the NFL where that would not be an option. The guy simply would not be in the vicinity because the plays are not being designed that way. So I, I'm kind of curious. I don't know how much there's, that is true, that it's just 100% Travis Kelsey deciding to goof around and throw a lateral when he can yeah, Mahomes was on the the post game, yeah. uh, you know, dais with the people, and he said, "Yeah, like he does it in practice a bunch, and he's not supposed to. It's not part of the play." But like you said, I mean, Noah Gray is running like a, a you know, like like right in the perfect path it's to where you'd want line. to hypothetically lateral the ball. I got a feeling maybe it's it's a little bit of a it's an option, it's a choice. Yeah. Please don't do it unless it's like perfect. <laughs> and, and in that situation, I think, you know, there was no one near Noah Gray. Kelsey was flat footed at that point, so it made a lot of sense. Got them the first down, but. Yeah, I, I think maybe they're just kind of trying to hide that from the people a little bit. I, I'm sure it's an element they're at least open to doing, you know, once or twice a game. It looks too much like other plays in the NFL over the last few years that are clearly by design, right, that have been drawn out specifically for, like, crazy third in a million situations or late in the game. It's like they are similar plays that have a specific design support line by a, a player running a different route to arrive right after that guy catches the ball. Like, it's... It's too well coordinated for this to be just complete coincidence and, oh, no, Travis has done it again. Like, let's stop him doing that. I think it is part of that offense, and he's the perfect guy to be executing it because he's, you know, he does it and he's capable of doing that.